Hello, this is Dean Kernut, and welcome to the Alpha Exchange, where we explore topics in financial markets associated with managing risk, generating return, and the deployment of capital in the alternative investment industry. Native Australian, Christian Hoff capitalized on the financial crisis to co-found Quantitative Brokers with Robert Almgren in 2009. After working together on the development of agency, algorithmic technology, and equities and equity options, Christian and Rob saw an opportunity to apply some of that IP to the world of fixed income where no such solutions existed at the time. Christian describes the trader's dilemma, a challenge that an investor faces in executing a desired trade now, but with little market impact, and his firm's efforts at helping clients understand and minimize the implementation shortfall. Our conversation provides insights on the early days of QB, where countless hours were spent in the lab studying the rule book of Eurodollar futures to better understand microstructure mechanics that underpin algo execution strategies. We also talk about research at QB, including its deep dive into the Treasury flash rally of October 2014 and the VIX spike in February 2018. Lastly, Christian shares his views on the future of agency electronic execution, including the trend toward more robust transaction cost analysis, improved access to more markets such as FX, and centralized clearing. I hope you enjoyed this episode of the Alpha Exchange, my wide-ranging conversation with Christian Hoff. Joining us from Australia, by way of Australia, Christian, uh, welcome to the Alpha Exchange. Uh, pleasure to be here again, Dean. It is uh, great to have you back in the office. Christian, love to uh, learn more about the formation of quantitative brokers. You've done something super innovative. You uh, you capitalized on the volatility coming out of the financial crisis in, uh, in 2008 to form uh, this firm with your partner, Rob Almgren. Why don't you walk us through uh, first some of your background, how you got into uh, the world of electronic trading, and then how that uh, ultimately led to you guys uh, uh, hanging a shingle and, and deciding to do something uh, super innovative. So wh- why don't you start with your entrance uh, into into the world of uh, electronic trading? Yeah, thank you. And appreciate the opportunity to be here today, mate. So Rather unconventional path. Um, I'll fast forward through it, but a uh, native Australian ultimately went uh, backpacking around the world, um, settled in uh, this small cold town called London, and after some time on the ground there, was fortunate uh, during the dot-com boom to land an opportunity under an IT analyst program with Barclays. Uh, that fed into an opportunity to rotate to Chicago uh, circa uh, 2000 and would be the electronic agent for Barclays on the floors of the CBOT and CME, mainly fixed income, treasury or broker pits. And from that, ultimately moved to Bank of America, got to work with some very influential partners and, and leaders uh, in the electronic trading space and derivative space. And also, fortunately, started to uh, work closely with a gentleman by the name of Robert Almgren. He was head of quantitative strategies. I was head of electronic derivatives. And uh, during this period, 2006, six seven, we driving some innovations, not just in equity algos, but we could see opportunity in equity options for smarter agency execution tools in the form of algorithmic product. And the further we dug and the further we expanded those initiatives, we identified that outside of the world of equities was a huge demand uh, from the client base for smarter execution tools, very similar to what they had in the equities and equity derivative landscape. And that uh, coincided with a significant volatility event and almost a transformational event in the industry and for me personally, which saw, obviously we're talking about the financial credit crisis, saw a window of opportunity where it was apparent that banks rightfully couldn't invest into expansion ideas such as that of uh, researching and development of algorithmic agency products outside of equities. And so Robert and I ultimately saw the opportunity to start somewhat naively 
and ambitiously start our own uh, entity called Quantitative Brokers, QB, with the focus of uh, specializing in what we call non-equity algorithmic optimal execution, but it ultimately was refined to being that of focused on futures, derivatives uh, as a starting point. So there's so much, there's going to be so much to talk about here in terms of the the insights you had uh, early days and starting the firm and, and what you've learned along the way. I want to go back and, and, and talk a little bit about the development of some of the smart order routing in the equity derivatives landscape. And I'm dating myself here, but back in the late 90s, uh, if you wanted to do an options trade uh, and you saw a certain number of contracts available on a certain exchange, you'd pick up the phone and call the floor and try to lift that, whether it's a 50 lot or a 100 lot. And all too often, you'd get the comment back from the uh, the floor broker, oh, the guy moved. It's no longer there. You know That 50 lot, uh, he, he moved before you bought it. And so what you guys started doing uh, early days of uh, electronic trading in, in derivatives, of course, it's a vast it's a vast universe of, of, of access points now in, in the listed options market for equities. But take us through some of the early days of, of, of the ability to route trades, to leg trades. What was that like in, in the, uh, I'm assuming we're talking about sort of 2004 and five, that time period? Yeah, that's right. And to look back now, obviously, things sound very primitive and basic, as will today when we look back in five or 10 years time. But obviously, back then, DMA almost is the starting point of the electronic evolution for any asset class. And that can take on different forms. Obviously, the benefit of listed markets is ultimately, you know, there was a pit, like when I was in Chicago in 2000 for futures markets, and the same was with equity derivatives. Those have over time evolved, mainly through the influences, again, of technology and generally led by that of the market maker community towards CLOBS, Central Limit Order Books. And worthy to note here that each market or asset class has its own market structure, and that's very influential in uh, the problems that the traders face. And you illustrate a very good painting of uh, what an equity derivative trader at that time has been struggling with and may still do today. And so, DMA, uh, electronification, that was a big mandate in the early 2000s for people in the seats uh, that I sat in uh, at the banks. And then as time evolved, it became apparent that having a smarter order type than just a limit order was beneficial to the end user. And those could be icebergs, those could be stop triggered, price triggered limit orders. And that has evolved um, into what we now specialize in, which is agency algorithmic tools. But in the case of uh, fragmented markets like equity options, you're dealing also with the need for smart order routing. And there becomes another dimension of challenge where you receiving feeds from multiple locations or venues, and they may even have market structural nuances to them about make a taker, which affect the economics of uh, if two exchanges are showing the same price effectively for the end consumer or trader, it's not the same equation. And so a lot of work was done in that era, pioneering work in equities and equity derivatives to uh, refine these smart order routers to help try to solve uh, for those problems. And and that's the storyline somewhat that feeds into uh, your friend of, of one of your books down here, uh, Michael Lewis's Flash Boys which is very near and dear to our industry and, and our community. So Rob Almgren is a, a real pioneer in the world of algorithmic trading, co-author with Neil Chris of, of that uh, that paper that really set the table for the development of the industry. Provide some color on on, on that. What was the, the basic framing of the problem that they sought to, to help uh, identify and help uh, investors solve? Yeah, so, so Robert's work, um, still highly cited and recognized and so influential uh, across our industry still to this day. He published, for those that aren't aware and to clarify, he published with Neil Chris, another big figure in Wall Street, a seminal paper, um, Optimal Execution of Portfolio Transactions, around early 2000. And that paper was a continuation or adopted and extended upon some prior terminology that was defined by uh, Perold in 88 around implementation shortfall. 
and that's a measurement is still cited today and and probably the most important reference of benchmarking slippage and it's in crude terms talking about um, defining at the time that you have a trade decision from that very time through until when you achieve or establish the position of that trade what's the change in the market price and that's implementation shortfall so robert's work uh, with neil chris fed into what's called a rival price and so they set out and published uh, in this paper a model that looked at the trader's dilemma and we talk about a lot of this at qb and people in our seat and and the trader's dilemma is one that has existed since the dawn of time and still to this day and essentially it's a reference to you have the option as a uh, once you've made that decision to trade you have the option to trade instantaneously and have what's called market impact and uh, that can be both temporary and permanent the other option you have is to take time and work the order in whatever means you see fit but therefore you're exposing yourself to uh, price volatility so Both are very credible propositions, particularly if you have high alpha and high conviction, you should just maybe hit the book. And still to this day, a lot of markets trade in that way. But we are philosophically uh, of the opinion and we're driven to this conclusion by data that you're better suited to have a trade-off and a balance between those two and an algorithm will work towards a what's, what's an optimal path to execute that order. So Robert's paper, uh, Almgren Chris paper, refers to some efficient frontiers. And in equities, because again, this is in 2000, very pioneering, they were able to provide the model around a rival price. And that's set off this new evolution of smart execution tools in the industry that are now going into, obviously, FIC markets, as is illustrated by what we do. So when you launched uh, QB, you, you guys effectively... Uh, really started in the research lab, and you had this this framework for uh, assessing the trade off between getting done now versus taking some time risk. And you guys were pioneers in some of the the trading strategies that had built in equities. What was the early days of that research process at QB? What were the markets that you started studying, and what did you learn in the midst of of that study about uh, you know, perhaps the the difference in uh, equity markets versus some of the the futures markets you studied. So QB, we decided our vision was to be and become the market leader in optimal execution across FIC markets, fixed income currencies and commodities. And that's a wide gamut of asset classes. So we decided, and it turns out wisely, to start with the derivatives complex and that mainly on the CME. And this is in 2009, 2010, when we just started funding the business and, and getting it going. Because it was multi-asset, it was CLOB, uh, there was no smart order routing requirements because everything's singly listed. And what really, I guess, enthused us was as we dug into the data on these products, starting mainly probably with the fixed income complexes of euro dollars and benchmark treasuries, we saw microstructural mechanics that were so fascinating, uh, complex, quirky, and it's therefore an opportunity for us to engineer, algorithmically engineer, uh, and also research and develop methods that could lead to smarter execution. We saw, look, we have a paper on this on, on our website, which highlights some, and even some videos, which highlight some of these nuances. But, you know, the STIR complex is a pro rata matching engine. It's not price time. So you have to think about things differently, um, whether you're a small order or a large order. Um, there's a, a lot of implied liquidity dynamics across that complex, which goes out 10 years, arguably five years of liquid contracts. And as a result of wrongful or rightful, uh, but the realities of how the matching engines work on that exchange at that time, there was things and still are today, hidden liquidity that comes from implied calculations that don't get disseminated. And so we're so excited to see these fresh problems and we heard firsthand with clients that these were problems they didn't have time to solve and uh, hence we we went down this path of focusing on the interest rate complex and over time expanded 
into the other asset classes across the CME. And now we've gone global across all the major derivatives exchanges and even cash treasuries. When you started doing this research, did you get a sense that anyone else was in the weeds to the extent that you guys were? And and, and I'm curious, uh, in, in some of uh, the conversations we've had over the years, it seemed to me that some of your work was so in depth that the exchanges themselves were learning from you. As you, uh, I, I was, I'm guessing, were soliciting data and questions uh, from the exchanges. Were they surprised to, to see some of the, again, the, the depth uh, of your of your study? Yeah, so that's a good point. At the time, I think we were definitely. Yeah, you know, from an agency perspective, first movers, and I emphasize agency because the market makers had always had this philosophy and this attention and uh, respect and value associated to microstructure and algorithmic engineering and design. And and we are all engineers, and so attention to detail is huge. But I think what was somewhat different in our case was we were agents and we weren't a prop trading community or group or firm. Uh, So we were trying to solve this for our customer base. And Rob is obviously from an academic background, very strong academic background and still to this day. And beneficially, we believe in transparency. And so as things were being found or discovered, yes, we were sharing that information back to the exchange their reactions sometimes uh, were receptive, but sometimes they maybe wouldn't acknowledge. And, and there's some classic examples where Rob actually and team d- identified ways that they could better compute implied liquidity to show more liquidity to the marketplace, which is beneficial to all. So we're probably a bit more transparent, as you'll see from our website and the research on there and what we do in the market than maybe a proprietary trading firm who would identify this information, but use it for their proprietary gain. And so I think, you know, uh, we've helped evolve the marketplace and uh, our clients are very appreciative. And naturally, our clients want transparency. They they need to understand what we're doing, what problems we're solving, and they can guide us too, to that degree. And so when you did your first round of research, and I know it's an ongoing process, 10 plus years into the firm, but as you got past maybe phase one and you started to bring a, a product and a deck around to some institutional clients, what was the pain point that you thought you were seeking to address for them? Uh, And then as you started to get that early round of feedback, what were you hearing from clients in terms of the the types of challenges they they were were confronted with? Yeah. So the main problem, the problem we're solving is slippage. As an algorithmic agency broker, we're trying to solve for what is implicit cost. So total transaction costs is the sum of Explicit costs, commissions, and implicit costs, which is slippage. And what I think people struggled with back in that time and what we were facing was a huge educational battle to orientate their mindset around the big picture. Being penny wise and pound foolish was quite often the case. And understandably, they didn't have the technology or the data to see what we were seeing. And so what we're tackling is the slippage costs. And when you're dealing with futures products, as one illustration, the tick, the cost of the bid offer spread is north of $10, uh, in most cases, sometimes north of $30 in, in, in some products. So solving for, for slippage can really add value uh, and can be quantified back to the clients. So for us to go back and appreciate we're starting a firm which is a technology firm from scratch and uh, we certainly greatly appreciate those initial clients across America that you know got behind us um, had faith in us as we'd obviously tested as much as we could in-house um, the real proof wouldn't have been until wasn't until we could put it into the hands of clients and they could actually production trade so we were obviously able to do that and we and again grateful to that that customer base and the beauty was we were then able to start to get the feedback loop and it's a, a pretty black and white situation or business that we're in like we we're, we're saying we're going to solve for slippage we quantify that based on referencing each algo to benchmarks 
and then we have TCA, Transactional Cost Analysis Reports. And we had this from day one, and that allowed our initial client base and also prospective clients to start to see the quantification of what we were talking about was actually being realized. And that just kicked off, obviously, the feedback loop and um, certainly kick-started our business uh, in terms of adoption and you know, uh, acknowledgement from the clients about the importance of slippage. So first first markets that you sought to tackle were short-term interest rate derivatives, futures contracts. Uh, when At what point did you move overseas into some of the other products? And what can you tell us about uh, just the difference of whether it's the microstructure or just geographical uh, investor-based differences. What, what was that experience like? Yeah, so probably not the best business plan, but we we over we certainly had a an emphasis on attention to detail, and so our expansion uh, in hindsight was very slow um, because we were so attentive to detail from one asset class or or even futures class to the next class. And to this and to this day, we still actually progress in that manner. There's 50 of us now. There was six back then. Mm. So uh, obviously, we have a lot more scale and, and capability. But we we focused on the CME complexes first. And again, that was a broad cross sample of uh, got us into equity indices. It got us into commodities, into agricultural products, into metals. And then we were able to look at other interest rate complexes Overseas, so we went into European government bonds and to uh, that of the life market at the time. Um, now, volatility wasn't necessarily our friend back then. Low for long was uh, the environment, um, and we we're a commission-based service offering. Um, so we had our work cut out for us. Uh, so we did have good incentives to expand and diversify. And the benefit of as we've expanded um, has been that. Rates were low volatility, but we got into energy products and they were high vol. Uh, And so our engineering and modeling and research and development was tackling new problems. And the beauty is that those problems are now applicable to our rates environment, which has come full circle. So, So that expansion has obviously been good for us as a business and makes us more of a a relevant global solution to the the big asset managers and hedge funds and banks that we serve, but it's also made us smarter. Uh, And that's one of the the core benefits of being a a fintech firm and being an, an algorithmic business. We have zero human service or touch on the workflow. Obviously, there's a lot of human support, but as we learn something, as we model something and I see you've got papers in front of you, some of our papers. Those models evolve over time and can have great application to new asset classes we're getting into or new instruments in Asia Pac. So uh, we're very excited about that. Well, you mentioned um, that sort of during some of the early days of QB, we had this low for long, this forward guidance policy from the Fed, not maybe not volume inducing. Today, we got a non-farm payrolls day. That's a special day for the, the world of fixed income and, and certainly for bond bond and rate futures contracts. How do these days where it's a NFP or CPI, FOMC days, just maybe step really back and give us the high level of how these predictable days, we know when they're coming and we know that they have likely impact on on the on the world of of fixed income how does that get incorporated into the process of model building yeah so in our environment we have algo engineering and then we have quant research and um, we obviously have support and and operations and sales but um, the quant research is doing a lot of analytics and what you're touching on there is almost the lifeline of our company and is one that rob obviously oversees uh, and his growing team of quant researchers. And uh, we've published a lot of interesting papers on this very topic of volume forecasting. Um, and that's a core ingredient to algorithmic products like VWAP, uh, which many people may be familiar with. And uh, there's in futures, uh, there's some real nuances to doing volume forecasting. And we we actually do multidimensional uh, work or multi-dimensional forecasts in that we're forecasting for volume per instrument, even down to the maturity in the term structure of that 
instrument. We're looking at volatility and forecasting for that in the bins across the day. And obviously, even liquidity itself, like posted typical quoted liquidity during that day. Now, you're referring to scheduled uh, macroeconomic events, what we, we call them. And these are to end listeners, the likes of whatever you see in your Bloomberg Eco. And so that information is obviously programmatically available to us. We have a tick database on all the products that we trade on. And Rob and team have done a lot of work around uh, modeling the influences of those events on the trading day as it relates to what's volume around that event and in the minutes leading up to it and in the minutes leading after it for obviously volatility itself and volatility and volume aren't necessarily correlated. You can have uh, high volume and low volatility and vice versa uh, intraday events around one of these macroeconomic releases and and quote size. So we've had uh, to produce a functional model that smartly predicts how the market will behave going into that event and then also how it behaves afterwards. It's not necessarily symmetrical. So you need your own function and look backs uh, on how that's rendered and calculated. But this is um, core to some of the analytics that the algos digest. And much like a human trader, there's an awareness then in our algorithmic environment about seasonality. So uh, that's touching on, is this non-farm payroll more significant than prior non-farm payrolls? Uh, Is this speech um, from whoever from the Fed more sensitive to the market than other speeches? And also things like, is settlement price volumes likely to be much larger um, on this end of month or end of quarter than it has been every other day? Uh, And the answer is typically yes, but by how much? Um, So we have to then also amplify, if you think of that forecasted curve, we need to amplify how these instruments or events are influencing intraday patterns during uh, for each of these instruments. That's really interesting, this this notion of seasonality, because I was thinking about non-farm payroll specifically, and there was a period over time that non-farm payrolls, the, the beta of markets to NFP just seemed to be going down. And I think some of it comes back to the Fed's just, we're on autopilot, don't expect anything from the rate for, from rate policy to change for the foreseeable future. And now that that may be more in flux, right, where the Fed is transitioning, it's been tightening, maybe it continues, maybe it doesn't. You might argue that there could be a return of the sensitivity of the asset price reaction to non-farm payrolls. And so that's a part of what you guys are, I assume, in- incredibly data-driven to try to assess. Um, in that light, there's a, a few recent papers which I guess showcase how lateral we're starting to think as a firm around where you can source gaugements or gauging of that market sensitivity. I believe there's a paper that um, references uh, the crude futures market liquidity versus that of uh, the volatility in the oil VIX index. And it turns out that the drying up of liquidity over the months, uh, I think it might have been the, the end of 2018, turned out to be a highly correlated indicator of volatility in that index. So there's some fascinating future research and ways that we can make algos smarter and analytics a better, a smarter feed into the behaviors of these algorithms and uh, also hopefully, you know, help uh, highlight to clients uh, what we're seeing from the data that may influence how they want to behave and act uh, in their portfolio and transactions. So you've got a number of different algo products, uh, all with excellent names. I, I'm particularly like Strobe is my favorite. Bolt is excellent too. The What are these different products if you were to try to simplify it. And I know there's a lot of complexity here, but if you were to try to assign the the purpose for each of these in different in different uh, scenarios for, for the end user, what are these different algos trying to uh, address in, in different situations? So they're all trying to uh, resolve and minimize slippage relative to a benchmark. So let's walk through some illustrations. Uh, you, you reference one of our flagship products is Bolt. Um, now that's 
no coincidence, an arrival price strategy, obviously something that Robert's well known for. But interesting enough, uh, well, let me explain what Bolt is. So Bolt is looking to optimize execution uh, relative to the arrival price. And that's just the simple midpoint between the best bid and the best offer. So that's the benchmark, and all of these algos work on a on a benchmark that Bolt is trying to outperform. And where the average price comes in on that one particular transaction, the difference between that and the arrival price is your slippage. And then over over, over time, you build up a huge data set, and you're able to then demonstrate that uh, my slippage is on these products this amount. Now, I was going to say with in our case, our arrival price implementation of Bolt um, doesn't use a schedule, which is a very common question we get from um, the cult followers of Robert's work um, is uh, what's the fit and, and what's the schedule? Um, but the reality is in the futures products, <clears throat> again, where the tick size is so large, we've learned over time that you're best to be just dynamic and that's a smarter implementation or engineering, uh, and it leverages a lot of short-term pricing signals. But I digress, so I'll come back. So Bolt is a rival price. Strobe is uh, catering to the precursors and the first sort of forefathers of algorithmic execution, agency execution, is TWAP, time-weighted average price. Um, We see that as the most simplest, dare I say dumbest, form of algorithmic execution because it's not considerate of uh, price Um, It's really just arbitrarily pushed on a timing basis. VWAP is somewhat smarter, but again, you're scheduling, uh, and that's the essence of these these two benchmarks of TWAP and VWAP is you're scheduling the order, which we philosophically think is not the best way to go about execution. But with VWAP, at least you've got some volume input and sensitivity, and obviously we do that as best as we can, as, as, as illustrated by the conversation we had on uh, the V curves. Uh, we have closer, which does settlement price. So a lot of uh, indexing uh, passive investors and money managers uh, care a lot about the settlement price, particularly at the seasonal events of end of month into quarter. Uh, and so closer trades into a future benchmark, which is somewhat different. So there, the benchmark is the settlement price, but you're trading in advance of it, uh, which is really interesting. Lega uh, is for relative value trading. Uh, and that's uh, it has two different benchmarks. One is arrival price, as discussed before, uh, but on the synthetic instrument. Um, so there you might uh, you might do a VIX S and P index multi leg structure trade, and uh, it'll try to optimize relative to the implied or the inter commodity arrival price on that synthetic structure. But then you have target price is probably the more common implementation of relative value trading and that is a user-defined level again on the synthetic instrument that you want the algo to execute at or better and so uh, and then we have lastly and definitely not least uh, octane uh, referencing to a a liquidity Um, this has been our most recent uh, product innovation and it's catering to a lot of pms and traders um, have a trade which they just have to get on and subsequently, you're going to have market impact, or you most likely will. And what they wanted, uh, what they would usually do would be a market order and just get the trade done. But we went back and, and researched and developed and came out with Octane, which the benchmark is a sweep to fill, we call it, which is a market order. And uh, But Octane will work the order. It will allow the algo to be a large percentage of market share, but it will use what we call liquidity signals uh, and be smart as to when it aggresses and takes out resting um, liquidity, which is of a significant and appropriate size and a good price point. That's been really popular and uh, we're seeing that as a really effective tool to beat sweep to fill. So th- that's how each of the algos are orientated. And again, TCA provides ultimately the measurement of are these tools solving that problem for the trader. I, I know one of your areas of research was uh, around the uh, the bond, as you call it, the flash rally. I certainly remember the flash crash in equities in 2010, but uh, you, you guys have done a sort of a deep dive into the, maybe not the cause, but just the the way in which the uh, the the big uh, huge rally, uh, maybe over half an hour uh, or so in in duration in October of 2014. What 
led you to do this research and what did you learn from from looking at that gigantic move in rates? Yeah. So we were driven to look at it because obviously we have a lot of interest rate customers and over time we've expanded QB into US treasuries and it was obviously a phenomenal black swan event and uh, black swans are uh, the typical default color of swans in the part of the world I live, which is Perth. <laughs> but nevertheless, it was a rare event. And we wanted to understand, obviously, the influences uh, of that event. Um, and you know, being a, an electronic algorithmic business, uh, we're constantly needing to back test and, and ensure that you know, our behaviors are appropriate given all market situations. But when we dug into it, and there's a paper that we published on this, which I think just validates what the general consensus now is on the day. And for those, let me just illustrate. I think it was about 9.33 in the morning that the market started moving significantly, but by 9.35 New York time, it was really rapidly rallying and it peaked at about 9.40 in terms of the size of this move. And then interestingly, over the course of the next five, seven minutes, it mean reverted, but almost symmetrically to the run up that had occurred prior to that up until 940. And some of the causes uh, or, or beliefs of, of the influences were obviously market sensitivity uh, at the time, but there was a lot of hedging that was occurring uh, from, the, the, from the market uh, into the, the cash markets itself. There was definitely market structural changes that had been going on for some time that came to the fore. And uh, I'm speaking to the shift that has occurred in the time that we've been doing QB of who the liquidity providers in even government bonds. And 10 years or 20 years ago, it was all the major Wall Street firms were the major liquidity providers in government bonds. But through even leaked reports from Broker Tech some time ago, and, and if you ask most people really close into this space uh, who the true liquidity providers are in these electronic clubs for treasuries, uh, it's almost uh, of the 10, uh, eight would be non-bank names. And that's a seismic shift. The primary dealers, uh, which I'm referring to, are still active, very active in the marketplace. Um, but they evolved themselves into um, doing their internal pools, which sit up in the D to C space, dealer to client space, and internalize their own activities uh, from their mortgage desk and corporate desk and treasury desk, etc. And that left the broker techs and the e-speeds, which the IDB environments and purely CLOB environments as almost the epicenter of liquidity, but it was predominated and dominated, sorry, by these alternative liquidity providers. So going back to that flash rally, as the yield started moving, <laughs> the significance of those moves occurred. And it was almost a natural behavior for risk officers to go risk off and uh, either widen their quotes out to the client base uh, from the primary dealers and or turn off their internal engines and let the flow go through to the IDB pools, uh, which were namely Broker Tech and eSpeed at the time. And to the credit, and I don't know if this was has been given a, a, as much as it should have, while it was a significant move, it still acted orderly. It If you look at our report, it was quoted and it traded at every price level. It moved a lot of price levels, but at no point did it gap or or dysfunction. There was liquidity always available for those that needed it, and no one went bankrupt. No one failed as a result of that event. Not saying it was an ideal situation, but nevertheless, they performed their function. They continued to provide liquidity, much needed, and then they controlled the unwind of what must have been you know, significant risk that they took on. So it's a fascinating event. Uh, we could talk a lot about it. Did you guys study, um, were there option trades as well that uh, occurred at the time that you could look through to? When you said, you mentioned hedging, and I'm wondering, was there a situation where a dealer had some Greeks that moved against the position that required them to 
you effectively buy a lot of Delta in a hurry. Um, was there any attribution from that standpoint? Yeah, I don't think we have a data print uh, or s- cited source to validate that. It was more from our interviewing and research and discussions with players on the street that uh, confirmed that that's what they were seeing as well during that period of time, which made sense to us. Uh, and I think you know some of the journalists also cited that as an influencing factor. Right, right. And so, what um, sort of the here and now, the the, the current day, in terms of you know, ask you to look forward a little bit. What's happening in the broad spectrum of of electronic trading? You know, market access seems to be forever increasing. In the U.S. listed equity derivatives markets, it's incredible <laughs> how much fragmentation there is, but also the ability to access that liquidity electronically is pretty fantastic. There's a lot of implied liquidity that you can you can access. There's complex books that you can access. H- has the the futures market access for derivative products electronically? Has that translated into? Can you do something similar in, in the options products at this point? W- what's what's the growth been on, on that front? Yeah, I can probably, in the interest of time, say some bold statements here, how we see the future playing out. But electronification is here to stay. And that's not a bad thing. A, you know, there'll be a lot more uh, transparency analytics for the client on seeing the quality of their execution. And again, this implicit cost, I think people appreciate implicit cost, but they have no way in which they can quantify it. So I think multi-broker TCA will be a massive enabler, an educator, and subsequent changer in behavior. We're seeing, and we think it will continue, the significant market influences and market participants like CME and other major exchanges continue to look for alternative asset classes. And that's illustrated in the recent CME acquisition of Nex, which Nex is uh, the umbrella entity for that of BrokerTech and EBS, the FX, spot FX market. So clearly access is going to continue. There may be themes of central clearing, particularly there's discussions around that in the US Treasury marketplace, and that'll be very helpful to transparency uh, and more ubiquitous democratized access to marketplaces. When you look at the asset class spectrum, obviously equities continues to be the most evolved. It's got its own nuances, challenges, complexity. Equity derivatives wasn't far behind it. Given its linkages, that makes a lot of sense. Given the international equity landscape, FX, we already see a lot of algorithmic agency tools in FX and TCA in FX, and that's a fragmented stream, almost stream and club based in market structure. Futures, obviously players like us are already in that space. But then you have at the far end uh, in the in the fixed income sense, obviously government bonds, we're there, but uh, corporate bonds, uh, another problem a market for transparency and best X with millions of um, QCIPs and obviously very liquid profiles. Um, But we think those problems will be continually solved. Now, also want to emphasize no doom and gloom here. There's not going to be Armageddon in terms of computers just all running the street. In our time, I've rarely seen uh, a lot of jobs displaced, if anything, jobs created. And and we all, at QB believe a lot in um, the harmonious uh, combination of human and computer, and we don't think that goes away. We're just looking to make people more productive and more efficient and achieve their business goals. And naturally, when you make people more productive, they find more things to work on. And I think that's good for all of us in growing this industry. It's interesting. I just had come across an article, I think I forwarded it to you, where I think it was an institutional investor, and they essentially said that uh, the algorithmic sale, which is more of a product sale, I want to get this on your desktop, versus the the more prototypical uh, Wall Street sell side relationship sale. That's a little bit more idea centric, and and I don't have a product. I'm getting to know you and trying to build trust. This uh, piece in II was making the point that actually there's quite a bit of that trust building process, even for something like a, a product sale, uh, like algorithmic trading. And it seems that you certainly recognize that as well. That it's uh, there's a trust building and comfort building as well. Yeah, as much as our business is 100 percent electronic. There's a reason we travel a lot in our seed and I'm over this other side of the world is because 
relationships matter and rightfully so and they're the source of all of our prioritizations they're influential in us getting new product ideas or new engineering ideas and you know we continue to emphasize to our team to you know work closely with the clients and we act almost like a consultant and we 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 often actually think of ourselves as an outsourced quant execution team for the end users the buy side the sell side and cuz our our domain of expertise is deep in this microstructure this algo engineering and you know that's almost a complement to them and the work they do around alpha generation and and risk management um, we're less involved and influential in that. Whatever data we can provide, we will. Um, but at the end of the day, we're solving for their best execution and we're navigating their workflows. So the other thing you learn about being in the algorithmic engineering business is it's one thing to solve the execution puzzle, but you also have to make it accessible to the end user such that it's not a major pain or diversion for them to actually access and use so we integrate with Bloomberg and with Reuters and and Trading Screen and TT, all these different platforms ready, and we continue to do that so that our engineering or, or, or benefits are available, but without dislocating their environment. And then we can just focus on uh, that consultative dynamic. And, and it's all about in-person and having that relationship as you talk about. Well, it's been uh, fascinating to watch the the ten year evolution uh, of the uh, of the business plan and, and to see all that you guys have accomplished. And super excited about what the next ten years brings as uh, as well. So, Christian, thanks so much for for uh, stopping by the Alpha Exchange. Great to see you, and uh, uh, look forward to watching the progress. Thank you. Appreciate it. Cheers, Dane. You've been listening to the Alpha Exchange. If you've enjoyed the show, please do tell a friend. And before we leave, I wanted to invite you to drop us some feedback. As we aim to utilize these conversations to contribute to the investment community's understanding of risk, your input is valuable and provides direction on where we should focus. Please email us at feedback at alphaexchangepodcast.com. Thanks again.